How's everyone? <laughs> I'm Gopels, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I feel a little bit like uh, I'm doing something today that we all experience the day after Halloween, when you walk into a place and suddenly all the Christmas decorations are up and you're going, hey, it's not Christmas yet. Why are we celebrating? So we're in a story in, in Matthew's Gospel that is usually reserved for the Christmas season. But we're going to take a look at it because we're working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And so in Matthew chapter 2, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it arose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the, chief, uh, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are, they are no more. This story is actually about outsiders. Uh, Matthew is writing to, uh, he himself is Jewish, and he's writing to a Jewish audience. And he seems insistent on including people who don't fit the traditional mold of God followers. We've seen it. He started in the genealogy by including four women in the genealogy of Jesus that were also not Jewish. They were Gentiles. And he seems to include in, in uh, constantly this idea that God is not just the God of the Jewish people, but God is the God of the world. And it's a concept he's going to keep coming back to over and over again. The point is, is that everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. The Magi were not the only outsiders. Herod is also an outsider in the story. And neither Herod nor the Magi fit the traditional description of, of what God followers look like. So what happens when outsiders are invited to be part of the birth story of Jesus? Well, we're going to find that out. We are getting a very important clue in this story, though, and that is that Jesus is not just going to be the king of the insiders. He didn't just come for a specific ethnic group or a specific country or a specific nation. He came to be the prince, the king of all the kings, 
the Lord of all the lords. He's come to bring peace and justice to the whole world. His mission has always been global. It started that way. And even in the last chapter of Matthew, you see Jesus telling people, telling his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. His kingdom will be different. It will not be limited by lines on a map or by the language that people speak or the lineage you come from. Everyone is welcome. How many are glad you're invited to the party? Yeah? Now, even at the birth of Jesus, Jesus hadn't grown up and he hadn't said anything controversial yet. The only thing that had come from his lips was a cry. And yet he's already a threat to the power structures of the world. He's born into a land that is going through great tension. There's a lot of violence and there's a lot of fear. God did not wait until circumstances were optimal for him to show up. God's ability to do something is not determined by how well or how poorly things are going for us. In fact, in this chapter, there's three occasions. We read two of them. There's one more that's later in the chapter we didn't read. It's in verses 15, verses 17, and verses 23, where Matthew refers to a prophecy from the Old Testament being fulfilled. And, and he uses, he actually refers to multiple prophets in that. His, the point that he is making is that when things are at the darkest, God still fulfills his word. I want you to hear that. When things are at the darkest, God still fulfills his word. Whatever situation it is that you are facing currently is not able to neutralize what God has said, what God has promised, or his ability to keep it in your life. God keeps his promises no matter what. Now, the announcement of the birth of the new king causes some very different reactions in people. So we're going to take a look at that. How do people respond when they hear about Jesus? Well, some people are activated. The Magi were. They, they were aware of an ancient prophecy, probably from the book of Numbers, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But when they heard about something and they saw something that seemed to signal it, they were the kind of people who just didn't find it curious and interesting and then scroll to the next point of interest in their life. They just simply got up and headed on a trip to, to find out who would this king be. Some people are passive, and you see this in the religious leaders. They're aware of the scripture. They know where the Messiah is going to be born, but they actually don't move in that direction. It's one of the great temptations of spiritual life is once you've been in enough rooms like this and once you've heard enough messages from people like me and once you are familiar with scripture, you assume that there's nothing else to see for yourself. You just become kind of passive. It's easy to do. And then some people are threatened. Herod had gathered the information, but his intent was to eliminate the potential threat to his throne. The events of this story put people right on the edge. For those who think that the birth story of Jesus is a, a sweet little story, it's not. It's a thriller. It has political intrigue. There's danger. It's life and death. Now, we have some traditions handed down to us regarding the Magi. Some, of them, some people believe that they were three kings. We, we actually don't have any indication that they were kings. Um, uh, in fact, we don't have any indication there were three of them. We don't know how many magi there were. So, oh yes, we do. It, it's in the Christmas carol. We three kings of Orient are. They're, it's there. The, the Christmas carol is not in scripture. <laughs> Somebody th found words that rhymed, and that's how they made that up. How did they come to the conclusion of three? Well, probably because there were three gifts given. So that's how they came to that conclusion. So who were these magi? It's the word magicians come from, by the way. And the magi were a group of priests that were actually responsible for the education, training, and testing of potential royals to the throne. We're first introduced to them in scripture back in Daniel chapter uh, one and two, where um, uh, they are people who, uh, well, Pharaoh refers to them as magicians and astrologers and astronomers and soothsayers and, and that kind of thing. And he had put a test before them. He'd had a dream he couldn't remember. Has anybody ever had that happen to you? Well, it's because you didn't remember. But uh, he, he had a dream he couldn't remember. And, 
And, and he woke up and he, he knew it was important. And then he told all the magicians, he says, all right, I need you to interpret my dream. And they said, great, what's the dream? And he said, I, I don't remember the dream. And, and they said, well, the, we, we, can, we can interpret a dream that you remember. And he said, no, if you're good at your job, you can tell me what the dream was. And, and they said, that, that's not fair. And he says, okay, then I'm going to have all of you killed. And uh, when Daniel heard about it, he asked that the, the king actually give him some time. And, uh, and so he prayed and God showed him the dream. And one of the things that, that Daniel asked of the king is that he would not kill all of the magicians, all the magi. And so in a very real way, they owed their life to him. He had a huge influence in their lives. But they would train royals, and they would train them in many areas of life, math, science, all these things. And when the person was passed, had passed the test, they were the ones who would place the crown on the head. In fact, you could, in a very real way, say they were king makers. You can see why Herod would be very troubled. Why King Herod would be very troubled that king makers just showed up in his town. So... He's very upset. He's worried about their influence. He's worried about what people will think of this. And evidently they had, because probably because of the influence of Daniel, had come across a passage in the book of Numbers which identified that there would be a king that would be born who was king of the Jews. He would be the Messiah. And there would be an anomaly in the heavens that would signal the timing of that birth. And so this is the thing about uh, that. They weren't just astronomers who paid attention to where the stars were in the sky. They were astrologers. They believed that the stars gave messages. More than that, they actually believed it had some kind of magnetic influence to control the affairs of men. That's why when it says that outsiders were invited, that these people really are outsiders. And uh, so how are we to think about this? Well, the, the star that they saw that had been prophesied is kind of a blunt force guidance mechanism. It gives them a general sense of direction. There's a problem with the star, though, and that is that it can't be seen in the daytime. It travels very difficult at night. Secondly is that any cloud can obstruct your capacity to see that star. See? Uh, I know where the North Star is. In fact, I look at it most nights. And uh, if you have a, a general sense of where the North Star is, then you know how to go north or south or east or west just based on, on how you position yourself, right? But I can't look at the North Star and find the directions to your house. The, the, the Magi had a blunt force guidance mechanism to get them in the general direction. And what it got them to was to Jerusalem, and it got them to King Herod. And we only have one recorded sentence from the Magi in that interaction with Herod. And where's the one who's been born King of the Jews? We saw his star. We've come to worship. That star led them to Jerusalem, but it was scriptures that led them to Jesus. Creation, in a lot of ways, uh, can tell us something about God. In fact, in Romans, the first chapter, the 20th verse, we're told that. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Creation points us in the general direction. But it's scripture that points us to Jesus. This is why the church needs to focus on scripture. This is why we spend our time focusing on Scripture. I'm often asked why I don't weigh in on political themes, political realities more than I do. Why don't I help bring some understanding to maybe some legislation that is being passed or some person who's running for political office? And they're all intriguing distractions. But none of those lead us to Jesus. Jesus did not come for political purposes. Focusing on scripture leads us to Jesus. Focusing on politics leads us to politicians. 
I'm not suggesting that politics is an unworthy thing for people to be involved in. I have a lot of personal interest in and respect for, but I have no confusion at all. No one elected to an office and no law that is passed is ever going to make an eternal difference in anyone's life. There's only one person, one person that can make an eternal difference in anyone's life, and that is Jesus. That's a good place for an applause. What do you think? Yeah? I think so. When we follow politics and we're intrigued by these things, then we're interested in power centers. And we look to places like DC and Beijing, and we look to places like New Delhi, and we look to places like Tel Aviv, and we look to places like Paris, and we look to places like Madrid, and we look to places, all the capital cities of the world. And that's interesting, and it's intriguing, and powerful people live there. But we focus our time and attention on Scripture because Scripture is what leads us to Jesus. And Jesus is not just the king of a country. He's king of all the kings and he's Lord of all the lords. Amen. So when they get there, they fell down and they worshiped him. Now, this is interesting. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, 10 times he talks about people who fall down and worship Jesus. Why is this? And, and by the way, like in Mark's gospel, there's only one example of that. Remember, Matthew is Jewish and he's writing to Jewish people. And so what he's, and, and Jewish people understand, you only worship God. First commandment, only God. So why does he keep driving this home? Because he's telling us all, Jesus is God with us. Ten times he'll tell that story over and over again. Now, the Magi are not there to, to join some political cause or they're just there to worship. Why? Because worship provides meaning in our life. Worship provides meaning. Lots of people focus on what questions and where questions and who questions. If you're not married, you probably want to know who you're going to marry. Uh, if you don't have a job or you're not happy with your job, you probably want to know what job you could have that would pay better and, and be a better work environment for you. If you're not in school or you are in a school you don't like, you probably wonder what other school you could attend. And all of those are interesting and quite honestly important questions, but none of them answer the question of why you are here and why your life matters. It is in worship that we find meaning. And not just any worship, but the worship of Jesus. Now, Herod is an interesting person. Ethnically, he's Arab. Religiously, he's Jewish. In terms of culture, he's Greek. And in terms of politics, he's Roman. What else is interesting about him is he is incredibly cunning, and cruel. When it said that all Jerusalem was disturbed, that's because they knew who this guy and they knew what he what was and they knew what he did. He slaughtered one half of the Sanhedrin. There's 70 elders that were considered the leaders, religious leaders of Jerusalem and of all, all Israel. And he slaughtered half of the Sanhedrin at one point. He slaughtered the last remnants of the Hasmonean dynasty, which were considered kind of like the kingly tribe, the kingly group of people in Israel. He killed over 300 court officers. He executed his own wife and two of his own sons. He didn't do divorce. He did death. At his death, this is a true thing, it's in history. At his death, he arranged for all the notable men in Jerusalem to be brought into the Hippodrome. And when he breathed his laugh and the announcement went out, they were all to be slaughtered so that there would be weeping in Jerusalem on the night that he died. That's who this guy is. And he's going to add one more atrocity to his long list of atrocities. And that is, he's going to give a command, an edict, that any male child under two years old in Bethlehem will die. 
Why? Because he sees even a baby as a threat to his throne. Herod wants to rule. Herod wants to control. He's not interested in being ruled. He's not interested in being controlled. He's not interested in serving anyone other than himself. If Jesus is king, he is not. It's a unique problem. It's not just a unique problem to Herod. We also have this problem. If Jesus is king, we are not. If Jesus is king, we are not. In a very real way, Herod still lives. Even though historically he died within a few days after Jesus' birth, Herod actually lives in terms of attitudes that people have towards Jesus and towards their own lives. We would prefer that Jesus do our bidding rather than the other way around. We're more likely to go to God and tell him what to do than to go to God and ask him what to do. We want Jesus to make life easier for us. We want him to make life more enjoyable for us. We want Jesus to elevate us. We want Jesus to fulfill our agendas that we create. The question I have for you, you don't have to raise your hand or answer it right now, but if Jesus never did another thing for you other than redeem your soul and reveal who he actually was, is that enough for you to worship him for the rest of your life? Most of us don't actually reject the rulership of Jesus in every area of our life, but there are areas that we tend to reserve for ourselves. We have this shadow country that's a part of our heart, and we don't want Jesus trespassing there. It can happen. It's different areas for different people. Sometimes it's different areas in different seasons. But, but we all have trouble allowing Jesus to be the ruler of every area of our heart. We like to reserve some semblance of self-control. And so that's how we live. Uh, Jesus talks about truth-telling, and we're, we fully support that as long as it's easy to tell the truth and as long as other people are talking to us, we want them to tell truth. But when it's painful to tell truth or you're going to risk losing something because of telling the truth, we're not sure we want King Jesus ruling in that moment. How about the, is, the, the area of marriage and human sexuality? Well, if you like your spouse, you, you probably are, are very content to allow the, the rulership of Jesus to, to drive your agenda and your faithfulness to your spouse. But what if you're not happy? What if the marriage is going through a, a, a difficult season? What if you're not yet married? See, we have these areas where, well, I like Jesus when he's doing that. I don't want him involved in here. How about the teaching of generosity? Jesus talks a lot about how we interact with money. So we're very happy with the teaching of Jesus on generosity when we're on the receiving end, a little bit harder when we're on the giving end. See, the, the attitude of Herod is alive and well. Herod had an opportunity. When the Agi, Magi asked their questions, uh, he asked for the religious leader to search the scriptures. Where would this child be born? He was given information. Here's the thing is, uh, in case you're not convinced that the spirit of Herod still lives in the hearts and minds of any of us, uh, I think the cross proves it. Here was a man who only healed, he only loved, he only served, and yet he was put to death. He raised no army. He challenged no political powers. He didn't deny faith. He didn't abstain from worship. And yet both political and religious leaders colluded together for the purpose of eliminating his life. Both outsider Magi and outsider Herod were given gracious invitations to worship God. And Herod said, I want the information so I can go and worship, but that's not what he intended. Worship changes us. That's what's true. The, when the Magi found Christ, they fell down and they worshiped him. They gave him precious gifts. There's an interesting phrase that is used. It says, they went home a different way. That's what happens when you worship. You go home a different way. Their specific thing was that they were given a warning in a dream not to return 
act to Herod and then go home, but to go home a different way. What's happening? The people who used to look to the stars to make their decisions are now looking to the Savior to make their decisions, and God warned them in a dream. Recalculating a route back home in the ancient world was not an easy thing to do. It was quite dangerous. But a new king was now calling the shots. If we worship our job, if we worship our money, if we worship our positions, if we worship our family, then we will be changed too, but not in a way that we like. And we will add pressure to every single one of those things that none of them can hold up to. Only one being in all the universe can withstand the pressure of being God to us, and that is the true and the living God. Everything else crumbles under that weight. So Herod is furious. He realized the Mag Magi were not coming back, and he ordered one of the most horrific events in human history, the slaughter of children. Thankfully, Bethlehem was a small town. If this order had been given in Jerusalem, we have no idea how many children could have been killed. I'm not suggesting that a smaller number makes it any easier for any of the children or their families. Some Bible historians think as few as maybe 10 or 12, but it's a huge atrocity. And this is another reference There's a, in Scripture that there was going to be a, a slaughter of the innocents. That is how Herod would want to take control once again. Now, we might never consider such a horrific act ourselves. But I think it's fair for us to ask a serious question this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. And that is, uh, when we try to rule our own lives or allow others to do so, how does that affect the innocent people in our lives? Who gets hurt by our selfishness? by our inability to make Jesus the King of all the kings and the Lord of all the lords. Self-rule is selfish. I, I know that's not popular in our culture. But quite honestly, our, our culture is not working very well right now. I think it's fair to at least question some of the ground rules that our culture lives by. Jesus was born for all, including the Magi, and the Herods, and he would die for all. Now it's tempting in this story to focus on the Magi and Herod. But what I would rather you focus on is Jesus. Do you accept him? Do you reject him? Do you believe he was born for you and died for you? Do you believe that he was raised again to life for you? And if you believe those things, then the guidance mechanism of your life isn't some blunt force thing that easily distracts us. We go home a different way. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, uh, we acknowledge that there's a part of our heart that wants to be in control. And we acknowledge we prefer to call the shots. We're very reluctant when we see other people taking control. But will you help us separate our fear of others from our fear of you? And will you help us trust you with every area of our life? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.